Hello and welcome to Paradigm Playbook, a podcast for entrepreneurs in the business of sports. Your hosts, Dave Kozak and Steve Cook, are business owners, successful entrepreneurs, sports enthusiasts, avid readers, and longtime friends. For years, they've read every business book on the market and built successful companies with what they've learned. This podcast will give you the critical takeaways in just 15 minutes a week. It's a quick and easy playbook for building a winning sports business. And now, here are your hosts, Dave and Steve. If you know a coach, teacher, or business owner who could use our help, please refer them to us. We appreciate your support. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Paradigm Playbooks Podcast. I'm your host, Dave Kozak, alongside my co-host, Mr. Steve Cook. Good morning, Steve. Good morning, David. And as always, got a color man in the background, Mr. Niall Cummins. It's great to be here. Hey, Niall. So today we're kind of going off of uh, the lead-in from last week. We talked about customer service. We've talked about you know sales, the sales process. We've kind of gone through all of that progression. And, and I think it leads right into the conversation of scaling. And there's some challenges with scaling, Steve. Um, you know, we'll talk obviously about sports businesses. We'll talk about other businesses. Um, but the challenge of scale is not only a, uh, a challenge of space, it's a challenge of people, it's a challenge of quality control, and it's a challenge of all, all facets of business, right? We've all experienced or been a part of a business that went too far in scale and they started to fail at their operation. Yeah. And sometimes they start scaling too soon. Sometimes that's a problem. Before we dig in, I want to clarify the difference between growth and scaling. Okay. So children grow, you know, plants grow, things grow. So to me, growth is happen happens where scaling is made to happen. Mm -hmm. So I think that's where the definition is. So I often ask small business owners, you know, how's business? Oh, we're growing. And I find out. So the first question I ask is how much faster are you growing than the population in your demographic area? So that's always the first question on growth. Are you exceeding the demographics? So if you're not, mm -hmm. then you're shrinking. Mm -hmm. So scaling to me anyway, I don't know if this is a dictionary definition or not, well, but scaling out. is intentionally changing the size or scope of your business. Yeah. And, and I, I look at it in, in terms of that as well, except for typically when I'm going to scale, I'm going to multiplication, not addition, right? Yeah, so yeah. to me, I look at growth as addition. I look at scale as multiplication, right? Yeah. So <clears throat> obviously scaling starts at 2X. Yeah. So if, if you want to scale, we're talking about, we're going to double the size of your business. So I think to go back to your initial statement is that's why all these peripheral departments, everything is affected. Mm -hmm. You can't say, I'm going to scale with the same personnel I have. I'm not going to scale with the same space I have. I'm not going to scale with the same product line I have. Mm -hmm. So scaling is going to create is, is going to require massive changes. Yeah, and and I I for a long time studied uh the franchise environment because the the franchise is the definition of scale, right? Mm -hmm. If you look at a, you know, pick a hoagie shop that does a nice job and they're going to go and create a hundred hoagie shops, but they're going to employ new entrepreneurs into mm -hmm. those hoagie shops and they're going to get a royalty on the sales of that hoagie shop. And that's a scale move for, right. so when I start to think about scaling of a small business, I think about how franchises do it. And I reflect back on what makes them able to scale. So, and, and this is interesting because I'm in the middle of a, of a consultative, a business consultation where it has to do with, uh, business separation of partners and the inevitable uh, kind of handcuffs that the current partnership environment creates that keeps them from scaling. And so on the legal side, right, you have in most businesses an operating agreement, right? Mm -hmm. At least you should. And the operating agreement needs to be, you know, initiated and put in motion. 
But then as your business grows and your model grows, you should be going back to that operating agreement and making the appropriate changes necessary because that is the first part of infrastructure necessary to have what I think is a scalable business, right? So, so in your operating agreement, who are the parties to this agreement? So it's usually the owners of the agreement or the owners of the company are the parties, right? If it's an LLC, you've got members. Mm -hmm. How many members do you have? If you've got um, if you've got a S corp or if you've got a partnership arrangement, it usually determines the big picture things in the company. Mm -hmm. Scaling is a big picture thing in a company that most, most people you are either going to have to have capital injection or you're going to have to have an investment to do it, or you're going to have to go borrow money to do it. Scaling isn't, isn't typically something that just you whimsically create. It requires some more planning. And so Steve, this goes back to a conversation we had, I don't know, years ago on the idea of the business plan, right? Mm -hmm. And so the business plan, you spend all this time, you work on this business plan, you put it in a drawer. Instead, I look at it and go, you, you outline a business plan and you put it in a drawer, then you operate the business and then you reflect back on the business plan and back on the operating agreements and that stuff. And the reason I'm saying all this is because I think in my experience, in my, my companies, right, in the financial world, in the college admissions world and college planning and insurance, scalability really is made possible by infrastructure. And what is business infrastructure, right, is kind of the next question. Well, how do you communicate with clients? How many automations do you have? How many people do you need to do a task that you set out? Right. So for instance, let's say you're in a old school business, we'll call it, where phone calls are the only way you communicate with clients. Mm -hmm. Well, a person can only make so many phone calls in a day. So if you want to scale beyond, say, the 250 phone calls or whatever some individual can make, got to hire another individual, got to hire another individual. So can you change something in that model that al allows you to communicate more effectively without additional humans? Right. Well, infrastructure creates some of that. So some scaling is, is infrastructure in the business and some can be space, right? So we're, we're in the process of this. A lot of our current clients, the Paradigm Playbook consulting clients that we're working with right now, and we're doing um, scaling, expansion, growth, and launch, mm -hmm. bring them in. So one of the first things that I talk about is are all stakeholders you know, tuned into what we're doing. So if you're going to scale your business and you haven't um, had this in-depth conversation with all stakeholders and stakeholders differentiate from your LLC members or Correct. your partners, Correct. stakeholders can be your bank, your lawyer, your, um, your accountant. So if, if you're going to scale from, let's say you're going to 3X, you're going to, sometimes scaling is easier, larger than smaller. Mm -hmm. So we can get into you know whether it's easier to 10x and 2x, but if you're going to scale to let's say three locations, from one location to three locations, mm -hmm. it's something your accountant ought to know about because Without that question. they're going to need more help. They're going to need a different system. They're going to have to track this. Now, now we're running a competitive business within the business that stakeholders have to be aware of, and I think too often. Number one, growth and scaling are confused. Mm -hmm. And then two, they expect it to happen and we adjust as it happens. Yeah. A perfect example of that, Steve, is let's say you do expand to three locations and you've done nothing to make that easy. Mm -hmm. That's not scale. That's right. an attempt at growth. And what can happen is, let's say your business operates profitable. Nobody's saying you don't have a profitable business. And you're going you're gonna to open the same exact shop in the next town over. Well, you're going to have to hire the same exact staff and you're going to run the same exact profit margin that you have in that. Maybe there's some stuff you need to do up front, but can you scale, in my opinion, would be running the two shops with 150% of staff rather than 200% or, you know, yeah, a, 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 there's a, efficiencies of scale, definitely, correct. but there's also expenses associated with it. All of a sudden, now you need a roving supervisor, yep. let's say, to, to hit all facilities. Um, we saw this in a local um, baseball business here locally, actually a competitor of mine at Grand Slam, and they scaled, I think they went to seven locations mm -hmm. at one point. Very successful. They burn out 
a bunch of employees because of the travel time they're yeah. moving. So if you're going to try to scale, but only go 150% in employees, that may not be the best move. Yeah, correct. And I, and I think the, it's, it's not just the employees. So think about, you know, a small business owner and they don't have a payroll company. They just process payroll every week and they know they're, everything's attached. And all of a sudden you go to scale three locations, you got three times the employees and you, now you need a payroll company. Now you mm-hmm. need something different. You need the scalability. So the efficiencies are there. The thing I talk about with, with infrastructure is right. All of the different pieces we've talked about from, from marketing attraction models to closing deals, to moving forward, your process of doing that has to be easily repeatable. Right. Mm-hmm. I think, I think having a, having a, a refined process that is scalable and repeatable is the goal. Right. And so how do you create that? Right. Um, you, great example of scaling would be, you know, historically you walk in the door and you write a check and you're enrolled in the class. Mm-hmm. Well, can I get a email to you with a link for a credit card to process payments in at a more rapid pace and more efficiently and, and easier to know mm-hmm. that I'm everybody's paid that walks in the door for the class as opposed to, Hey, do you have your check for, for this class or, you know, not getting paid in time, things like that. All of those little types of efficiencies are towards that scaling mechanism. Right. And communication is, is huge as well. But if you build those efficiencies as you grow, then you're preparing yourself to scale. So, but I, and, and I think that's the, that's the point I'm trying to make. A lot of times we go about doing business and just, and we're just doing business. We're not, mm-hmm. we're not going back to that, that, you know, business plan that we conceived of where we were going and we're not editing and going back and saying, Hey, can I do this better? Can I add an improvement here that makes this a, an easier function? Sometimes we do. Sometimes we don't, right? Some people in business leave well enough alone, right? But that goes back to you're either growing yeah. or dying, right? Yeah. And, and, and process improvements are important from the, from the get go. However you do it is, you know, you're, you're keeping things on a handwritten legal pad in the beginning. And then it goes to a spreadsheet, then it goes to the cloud. And then, you know, all of a sudden it's you growing got a CRM all the time. and you got a, yeah, you know. now it's ready to scale and, mm-hmm. and you move forward. <clears throat> I think, I, I don't think that every business has to scale, nope. but every business needs to grow. Um, and so let's talk about the different ways you can grow, which then we can move into their ways to scale. So you can grow by adding space, mm-hmm. adding customers, adding offerings, products, services. You can add by if more efficiently using your space. Um, th- there's a lot of ways that you can grow that that all require a degree of planning. Yeah. Well, I, and I'll, I'll tell you a story about growth that's interesting too. And it, I think it adds some perspective to this conversation. I, I own and have owned for, I don't know, 15 years now, a, a property and casualty insurance business, right? So mm. home, auto, life, there's obviously investments and all that in it, but the PNC model, right? Everybody gets a, a car insurance mm-hmm. and every year your car insurance goes up. Right. Well, the interesting part about the business is as a business owner and customer service person, that's a hard thing to deal with. Sorry, I should say as a customer service person, that's a hard thing to deal with. Cause now I, Steve, I, you know, I, I, I wish it didn't happen, but you know, rates went up and it is what it is. Mm-hmm. And you know, you either like us or hate us. And if you know, if you hate us, you, you're going to shop anyway. But the point behind that is as a business owner, your rate went up. So too did my paycheck. Mm-hmm. So there's a, there's a growth in that, right? So we, we've talked about before where, what if you shorten your class to 55 minutes? Mm-hmm. By the end of the day, can you get another class in there? Or what if you raise your rate by $5? What happens? Is that a bottom line growth mechanism? Are you creating more profitability? Maybe. If you can't be done, if you're not thinking about that type of stuff, you're not, you're not thinking about the, the growth. And, and to be candid, Bottom line growth isn't the only type of growth, right? That's not what I'm insinuating. I'm just saying you have to be 
cognizant of all growth metrics that you're looking at and what are the growth metrics i think is the important part well i mean you you know the biggest retailer in the world at amazon their focus is on top line growth and they sacrifice bottom line growth to to get you in their thinking is that once in as a customer then your spend will grow so you're going to force it so they're willing to sacrifice a little bit of the bottom line growth to get you there i think I, I just did a workshop on, um, it was called, it was for uh, gymnastic clubs and the workshop was flip your waiting list into a revenue stream. Mm -hmm. And the whole thing is we hear a lot of people, you know, how's business? Business is good. I've got, you know, I've got 700 kids and, you know, 60 on a waiting list and they say it with pride and it sends the cold shivers down my spine as I think about. 70 people standing there with a credit card and me not taking it, which yeah. is, is anti my mindset. So I have a problem with that. So we went, we started going through it. The number of ways that you can change that business to eliminate that waiting list, all of which brings you more, more money. The one thing I know for sure about the waiting list, the ROI on that is zero. Yeah. There's no money coming in for that. Hey, if you're enjoying Paradigm Playbook Podcast, please share and tag us on social media. Your support is greatly appreciated. Well, and I think in, you're talking about a waiting list. I mean, we're in a society of shoppers, mm -hmm. right? What's the first thing someone does when there's a waiting list? Let me go online, see who the next closest is, who else has good numbers, who else has good Google reviews. Can I just go over yeah. there and if they'll accept me? So you're inviting people to shop your service against. And that's, it's not just that deal at that moment. It's the opportunity cost of all the future deals because they just got locked in with someone else. And if someone else is running a good business, they're never coming back well, in your door. It, so, it, you know, I started the, the, con, the uh, workshop off with saying, is if you have a waiting list, take it right now, put it on paper, go over to your customer, your, your, your competitor and sell it to them. <laughs> you know, the, now it's, now it's an income stream. Now it's a, now, is that a good thing to do? No. Is it going to hurt you long term? Yeah, but it's better than mm -hmm. having them sit there telling them I can't fit you in and having them go to the, your competitor, as you just said, and you're going to lose them anyway. Yeah. So, the, you know, there's a lot of ways. But I, I think, you know, we're in an area, and, you know, we talk about my Grand Slam business all the time. We're in a, you know, a fast growing population area. Mm -hmm. And so for me to say that my, you know, revenues went up by 10% last year is really not a good metric to, to hang my hat on if the population has gone up by 12%. Yeah. And so, you know, there's, there's a, something I'm dealing with in my company right now, because we are on the verge of, of a 10 X scale. And the, to your point at Grand Slam, right? A better metric would be how many new faces walked in the door, mm -hmm. not how much revenue did you make yeah. off the current faces. But if your population is expanding at a rate of 20% per year and you're capturing 10% in, in yours, you're not keeping up with that demographic, right. as you said. So that's another big issue that companies going to scale will have to face. Where are, what is, what are your metrics that you're measuring against, right? So Steve, if you're not collecting someone's name at the door, you're mm -hmm. not getting them to engage with your company in some fashion or another. You don't know where they came from, who they are. Mm -hmm. They just walked in the door and paid you money. So, th so you're looking at the bottom line there. You're not necessarily looking at the top line or the future growth or the exponential growth on that. So we're working right now very, very diligently on being able to systematically determine which marketing stream is generating the right type of client and cash flow into the business. And how many of those new people versus how many of those current existing people are generating revenue, right? If all of your revenue comes from your current client base, right? Which is a good thing. It's not a bad mm -hmm. problem, but you're getting no new. At some point, that, that gift stops giving, right? And so you have to be backfilling and understanding how you're backfilling and where they're coming from. I think one of the things that we should dig into a little bit, the um the conditions for scaling. Mm. So um, 
what's going to determine when is the right time to scale or what we need to scale or what do we need to do first in scaling? And one of the books that we reference frequently is the E Myth. Mm-hmm. And we talk about, you know, entrepreneurial seizure and when, um, you know, when you realize it and you, you go into this business and the three types of individuals that are running that business, you know, your, your innovators, your entrepreneurs, your managers, and your technicians. So if you're in a entrepreneurial business and you're still maintaining a role in management or technician, then you're probably not set up to scale because you're going to have to oversee and innovate everything that's new. And even if you have the, the franchise style business that you're looking for to think that you're going to, you know, take that whole thing and open it up here. It's not going to be exact. Your parking's not the same. Your building's not the same. It's not the same location. It's not the same driving distance to get there. Your marketing's not quite the same. So all that is something you're going to have to, to work on. And if you're not um, in the position where you're a true you know, entrepreneur, innovator, Matt, and, you know, and you're not running the day-to-day business, I don't think you're prepared to scale. Yeah. I mean, it's a great point. You just, you think about the idea of, well, hey, if I'm making half a million in profit in this store, whatever mm-hmm. the store is, I don't care if you're selling widgets or radios or gymnastics mm-hmm. or insurance, whatever. If I just do the same exact thing over here, mm-hmm. I'm going to be making a million dollars profit. It's not true. If you could pick up and put down that location and genetic makeup of your of shop A and sh- and B shop B, then yeah, maybe you are on something. But that's where the research becomes more valuable, and that's where you have to be out of that manager, out of that technician role, because to do that type of research effectively, you have to immerse yourself in data and sort it out. You and you've got to be able to look at your data as you exist today and the potential data that would exist in, in that B location or that other location, right? And I think a lot of that data, which that not everybody is, is getting that. For, you know, the number of people that are talking about opening a second location that have not done an in-depth demographic study, find out, and they may or may not have the full demographics on their current location. Mm-hmm. So a lot of people, you know, just grew and it works and we're lucky we're in a sports business and sports business is relatively easy to sell. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's something that there's, there's an interest in, um, there's a customer base for it and we're, the world is producing new customers, kids all the time. Yeah. And you're also, you're also talking about multi-generational interest, right? You're not, it's not exclusive to kids. It's not exclusive to adults. It's, it, it crosses into my business, right? I'm pretty exclusive sales and services, Mm -hmm. right? I'm selling to college bound students. I'm selling to adults for planning. I don't necessarily have that, you know, K through six or, or, you know, 18 months through sixth grade operation. I, I don't know what I would do to get it. I haven't thought through it because again, the same way that the, the beginning of the population is regenerating. So too are the college, college bound students every year. So mm-hmm. we've sort of got that constant flow in. We, so we see the, the second location sports business the the drive time in a sports business is exactly opposite of the age of the participant so in other words the the younger they are the least far they're willing to drive to get there so if you're running uh mommy and me two year old you need to be within 5 miles of home mm-hmm. and that's how it works and as you get older now you know we have you know, adult baseball players that drive, you know, 35 miles to come hit in a batting cage. So that grows. So when you go to your second location, which is your 2X scale. You got to think about that distance. Yeah. You have to think about that distance, which then affects the budget you put together. So if you're forecasting sales and you know that you're further away from the, 
drive time for young families, then you have to plan. It doesn't mean you can't do it. It means more of your income has to come from seven and older, eight and older, and not as much from mommy and me. But if you don't do the demographic study, then you're not really ready to scale. Yeah. And, and, you know, that reminds me of the, uh, uh, economic game theory, right. That comes into play. And there's an old lesson in game theory. It talks about if you had nine beaches, right. And I think I've been through this before, but beach one had a Coke stand and beach nine had a Pepsi stand. Uh, people from beach five would go both directions, but all the people from six, seven, and eight would go to nine. And all the people from four, three, and two would go to one with the exception of a few that just refuse, right? Yeah. I have to have a Coke. But (laughs) if you put the both stands at beach five, everybody would be more satisfied because they'd get the drink they want. And both of the companies would do better because they would sell more, Mm -hmm. right? As opposed to you may go to the Pepsi, you don't like Pepsi. And so you know, I'll pass this time or I'll, I'll get a water and said, now they're still making money on that. But if you make it that, that, you know, it's the same reason all the fast food joints are next to each other. Right. So when you're thinking about that drive time and, you know, let's say you're in a, a, there's also something to, to a well-established area versus a growing expanding area, Mm -hmm. right? If you're moving into a well-established area, there's competitive, uh, kind of constraints or elasticity to that at the same time. But if you were to set up a shop, you know, in town A and town B is five miles away and you set up the same same shop, isn't it conceivable that the people in town B would come to shop A? So then don't you really need to go another town over so that you're getting the best of both of those towns, right? And again, depending on the drive time and all that stuff. I mean, people talk about location, location, location all the time. And there's a reason that, you know, Burger King opens up across the street from McDonald's. Yeah. Someone's already done the research and knows that that location is going to draw. Um, now, you also see businesses across the street. If you're across the street on a divided highway, no, they're not the same location. Yep. So there's, you know, there's a AM drive and a PM drive, depending on the business, how you, and you have to look at that when you scale. I mean, I think there's so many factors that go into scaling which I'll go back to you as an entrepreneur, have to take that on. This is my role. And so the one thing that doesn't duplicate, when you said, you know, I'm, I'm doing X amount of dollars here and I'm going to move into this town and do the same thing. What's not, you know, the 14, 40 minutes, you know, your hours that you have don't transfer. You can't duplicate your time. So you have to become more efficient in everything you do which means that there's got to be a detailed plan for scaling. And with this said, Dave, I don't think we're trying to scare anybody out from scaling. We believe in it. And we believe, especially in the sports world for children, I firmly believe that the country needs more. Yeah, without question. Public schools are are stepping away from it. It's harder and harder. Um, Kids have so many distractions now. They need sports. So I think, you know, if you're looking to start into a sports business, now's the time to do it. If you're running one, now's the time to think about scaling, even if you're not going to scale for another five years. And I, I think, Steve, the, the point that is the most resonating to me and the one I think we should leave them with is if you're in a position where you are constantly working on your business as opposed to in your business, then you are at a point where you should mm-hmm. be working on scaling. Right. That's that's the thing. If you can focus every single day when you get to the office and and you can you can go through the demographic research and you can think through it and you can put all your concerns down, and you can check them off and you can look at locations and you can shop and shop around as to how you do it, then I think you're in a position where it's scale it's scale 30, you know. Yeah. <clears throat> Well, I, again, it's something that we could talk yeah, and, for a while. And, and we've only just hit the surface of the, the considerations you have to make when you're talking about scaling a business, right? There's investment in infrastructure that, that is out there. There's all kinds of things to take into consideration. But I think the biggest point, the biggest takeaway for people is if you're ready to scale, it's because you're working on your business 95% of the time. Mm-hmm. That's the case, then, hey, you should be thinking about it. So whether it's through scaling or just um, stabilizing a current business, I think one a good conversation that we can have is about, you know, you know, and uh, Gino Wickham says in in traction, 
you know, the right butts in the right seats. I think we can have a conversation of what players do we need in place? Who do we need in what seats? What's the most important structure to lay this out in any entrepreneurial business before you go to scale? Because what you don't want to do is scale an imperfect business. Yeah. So, no. Anyway, or, I think and, that's and definitely a, a good topic. Structure one. So I will pick up on that next week. Sounds good. What do you think now? We good? All right, everybody. That's been Paradigm Playbook. Hope you learned something and enjoyed it. Uh, right. As always, if you like, please click and subscribe. Press like. Give us all the all the kudos you can. Helps us get out there and, and helps us continue our mission to help small business owners uh, grow and scale their businesses. And we appreciate all the feedback. So uh, everybody go out and make it a great day. And if you're in a position where you want to consult with us, go to the website paradigmplaybook.com and check it out and give us a phone call. Thanks. Thank you for listening. Visit ParadigmPlaybook.com to discover how we can support you and your business.